How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Another exciting and welcoming evening to those of you who are tuning in. But well, we're glad that you have chosen to not allow anything to deter you from being there. And so we want to say thank you for coming together and being a part of our program for this very exciting evening. I want to remind you, though, that tomorrow night there will be no meeting, but we're going to have a very power-packed weekend with Bible prophecy meetings. Friday evening, our subject is entitled, The Tale of Two Women, and also Sabbath morning, that is Saturday morning for 11 o'clock. If you'd like to find out the secrets of financial freedom and how to have a financially secure future, you don't want to miss Saturday morning's topic. And also Saturday evening, the United States in Prophecy and Babylon, what the Bible says about those two vitally important end-time prophecies. But before we go any further, as we customarily do, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we invite God's presence to be with us tonight. Gracious Father, we thank you for your love and for your gracious mercy and for your tender care of your children as you have seen fit to allow us to be safe as we have gathered tonight to unfold the pages of Scripture. We thank you so much that the Bible is becoming clearer to us and we know that it's not just contributed to our study, but we thank you for the Holy Spirit who has promised to lead us and to guide us into all truth. Tonight, we thank you that we can sit down in comfort and in the security and relative peace that you have offered us. And we pray that as you direct us here in Manhattan, we pray that you'll be with those around the world. Gather us together and unify us for one purpose, to love you, to serve you, and to be ready for your soon return. And we thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, join me as we welcome our speaker this evening, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Good evening, friends. Welcome again to another edition, another study episode in the Millennium of Prophecy program. And I'm very glad to see each of you here in our Manhattan audience, as well as our friends who are studying with us across the country and around the world. It's thrilling, the reports that we're getting. But I'd like to hear what questions Mrs. Bachelor may have. And so I'm going to invite Karen out at this time. Good evening. How are you tonight? I'm going to go ahead and start. Go ahead. Should you kindle a fire on Sabbath? You know, there is a statement in the Old Testament where they were told not to kindle a fire on the Sabbath day. Matter of fact, one man was stoned to death during the time of Moses for going out and gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Does some of you remember that? Incidentally, that ought to tell you that it does mean something because when they found this man gathering sticks, they brought him to Moses and Moses said, Lord, what, we, what do we do? And the death penalty was pronounced, the same penalty for adultery and murder. And so for us to think that in the New Testament when God says let one man who regards one day above another, Romans 14, other man regards every day alike, Paul is talking there about the ceremonial Sabbath days, not the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments. Why would God say it's the death penalty in one place and the other place say whatever feels good? That's the, God's not fickle like that. But what about making a, a fire? This was a law that was specific because as they were going through the wilderness, he didn't say they couldn't have warmth. They were not to kindle a fire. They used to start fires and then keep them going, just like God inaugurated the Sabbath at creation, and then we keep it holy. And so a person could have warmth in their dwelling, but they were not to go out. Keep in mind, they didn't have matches back then. What was involved in kindling a fire? They're rubbing sticks together, and it was a little more work than it is. So they'd start their fires, but they weren't to kindle them. When they went to the promised land, the climate was not as mild 
as it was maybe in the desert. And they, were, they had the warmth in their dwellings in the wintertime because it got cold. They got snow in the higher elevations. And God did not say, thou shalt freeze on the Sabbath day. And so this was, he would say, no unnecessary work. Kindle the fire before the Sabbath, and then they could keep it going. They were to gather their wood in advance, not during the Sabbath day, and that's why that man was stoned. All right. You said that there will be people in heaven that did not keep the seventh-day Sabbath. Then why is it necessary for a Sunday keeper to change and keep the seventh day? Well, the Bible says that uh, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, I heard about a man who in England many years ago had a yardage shop. He would sell these bolts and lengths of cloth. And he had inherited this business from his father who got it from his grandfather and had been in the family for many generations. And he sold uh, three yards of fabric to a lady one day. He measured it out on his table. There was a yardstick painted on the table that had been there for years. She came back a couple of days later and she said, I went to make my pillows and there wasn't enough cloth and I measured it and you sold me short. He said, no, man. And I said, if I did, I'm sorry. He said, let's roll out your cloth here. And she rolled out the same piece of length that was left there and it was three inches short. Oh, no, it was, the, it was the same length on his table. And she said, well, I don't understand. She pulled out her tape measure and she measured it and it was short. And he said, wait a second, where'd you get that tape measure? It's wrong tape measure. She said, well, let's get another one. They got one from the hardware store up the street, and he went and measured the yardstick on his table. It was short. Well, the man was an honest Christian man, and he was really upset about this because he'd been selling cloth on that table for years, and he did not want to be selling people short. Evidently, in England many years ago, the way they determined a foot was by the length of the king's foot at that time. And so the initial table that had been inherited by the, the grandfather, the great-grandfather, the king had a shorter foot during that reign. And here for many generations now, they had been selling people a little bit short. Well, that man was still an honest man. He did not know that when people were coming in to do business with him. But once he knew that his measurements were not accurate, if he sold one more bolt of cloth using that faulty scale, is he an honest man? No. Not anymore. And in the same way, when a person knows what the Bible says and they say they love the Lord and they want to obey Jesus, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. When a person continues to worship on the wrong day when they know the day that God blessed is the seventh day, then it becomes a serious issue. When we know God's will, the Bible says, if we continue to sin willfully, Hebrews 10, 26, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for sins but a fearful looking forward to of judgment. It's serious business to know God's will and deliberately say, I'm going to go my own way and I'm going to do what the crowd does. That's dangerous. Okay. What about when one marries a person just to help them get a green card? Can they divorce and remarry and not be committing adultery? Karen said, do we want to include that question, Doug? But, you know, I've run into this several times. Uh, here, especially in North America, there's a lot of immigration and it's getting more difficult. And so in order to make it easier, people are agreeing to marry someone until they get naturalized and then they divorce. And they're wondering, is this okay? Well, I have the idea that somewhere in the marriage vows it says, till death do you part. And so the person, I think, is dishonest that is marrying for that purpose. They're obviously not, not intending to stay married and it's obviously not for love and they're, I think, abusing a holy institution of God for immigration purposes. And that is wrong. Amen? Amen. Just checking. <laughs> Isn't the first resurrection of Revelation 25 referring to the rapture of the 144,000 as the first resurrection? Well, the 144,000 are in the first resurrection, but they're not the only ones. The Bible tells us that there's a great multitude in Revelation chapter 7, I think it's verse 9, beyond the 144,000 that come out of great tribulation that are saved. Now, the, the 144,000, I believe, are alive and transformed, given new bodies when the Lord comes, and they're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then there are, of course, those who um, are dead and are raised. But there's going to be a great multitude that are still alive. Some people think that only 144,000 are alive, and I don't believe that's what the Bible is telling us. Just think about the day of Pentecost. How many were in the upper room, Acts chapter 1? 120. The 12 apostles 
plus a number of disciples. See, the 144,000 are like the last day apostles that get the world ready for the second coming. They're not the only ones. They're to do a work that converts a great multitude, like the ones who are converted on Pentecost. All right, for our last question. What does the cloud of witnesses mean in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? Okay, you know, the Bible tells us, remember we learned cloud often means a multitude of living beings. The Bible says Jesus is coming in the clouds. What kind of clouds are they? Clouds of angels, we, we discover. Then the Bible tells us that Gog and Magog cover the earth as a cloud. That's speaking of the wicked. It means a multitude of people. Have you ever seen a cloud of fish, those of you who snorkel or scuba dive, and it looks like one organism all moving and swarming together? I've seen it on the streets at rush hour here in Manhattan. It looks like a cloud of humanity. It's a miracle to me that people can cross the street without having head-on collisions. The humans, I mean. And, uh, but here when it says we have this cloud of witnesses, it's talking about from Genesis to Revelation, we've got the stories of these lives of people, those who failed, those who've had victory and succeeded, and they are there to bear testimony to us of uh, how we can be victorious. It's their record. It doesn't mean they're up there looking down on us. Okay? So we've got a cloud of witnesses in the Bible in the lives and the history of the patriarchs and the prophets. Well, let's go to our amazing fact for tonight. I enjoyed spending about 40 days and 40 nights in India this year where they have one of the seven wonders of the modern world called the Taj Mahal up in Agra, India. It was built in the 17th century by an emperor as a tomb for his beloved wife. And he incorporated 20,000 artisans who took about 15 years to construct this splendid, uh, beautiful building, the, the lake, the out front that mirrors it, the, the symmetry, the dimensions are all so exquisite and so perfect. And they, these uh, prayer towers that they've got, it's built in the Indo-Islamic design style with precious marble and stone and inlaid passages from the Quran. Uh, it's just uh, one of the wonders of the world to behold. What many people do not know is when the British occupied India, in the 1830s, they had planned to demolish the Taj Mahal and sell the marble. Matter of fact, the, de the demolition equipment had been brought on site and they were just about to begin tearing this beautiful structure down so they could sell the marble when word came to them that the price of marble was so low in India it wouldn't be worthwhile. Aren't you glad that the price of marble went down? You know, the Bible tells us King Nebuchadnezzar came and demolished the temple of Solomon that had been built in Jerusalem. And he carried the valuables and the materials back. But those things went back again to the promised land and that temple was rebuilt during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. The Bible speaks in the Old and the New Testament about a cleansing of the sanctuary and that is our lesson, that is our study for tonight. Jesus cleansed the sanctuary when he came the first time. Prophecy tells us he is going to cleanse the sanctuary again before he comes the second time. Now, the temple of Solomon that was one of the seven wonders of the world was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. But when Ezra and Nehemiah came back after the Babylonian captivity, they rebuilt it and it was later refurbished by Herod the Great. You know that wicked king that killed all the babies in Bethlehem? He was a passionate builder. And uh, here he was killing babies one day and then building temples the next. Yeah, he's the one who built Masada. Uh, he was a very paranoid man. And he built this fortress because he thought that he was going to need a place to escape to. This is a model you can find in Jerusalem today of what that temple must have looked like. Well, back in the time of Christ, Jesus had great regard for the temple. He referred to it at the beginning of his ministry. He called it my father's house. At the end of his ministry, when he walked out, he said, your house is left unto you desolate. Something very interesting happened to the earthly temple during the time of Christ's ministry. Now, when Jesus went into the temple to teach, keep in mind that temple, when it was first built by Solomon, there was such a holy air and sanctity about it, the original temple, that they would not even chisel the stones in the courtyard. Everything had to be prepared elsewhere. And they quietly ground the stones into position like a jigsaw puzzle. And all you could hear was the muffled tones of the stones being put in position. It was meant to be a sacred dwelling. The Shekinah glory of God had come down in fire there. The holy place was there. 
But by the time of Christ, as things often happen, the dignity and sanctity of the temple had been lost. Because pilgrims coming from out all around the Roman Empire to make sacrifices didn't bring their own sheep and goats anymore because they'd been scattered, there were salesmen available to sell the goats and the sheep and the doves to the visiting pilgrims. And more and more of them bribed the priests to be able to set up their little sales booths. They had a sacrifice salesman union, I think, in the courtyard. And when Jesus came into the temple court that was supposed to be a place of singing praise and songs and prayer, instead all he heard was the lowing of oxen and the cooing of doves and these salesmen barking out the best prices for their goats and their sheep. And it was just, it was like a flea market. It was like a bazaar. And fire flashed from his eyes and divinity flashed through humanity. And Christ made a cord of some of the, he made a whip of some of the cords that were hanging there by one of the stalls. It doesn't say he whipped anybody. But he spoke and he said, take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. It's to be a house of prayer. And you've made it a den of thieves. And there was so much authority in what he said that even though he bore no official office, in terror, the salesman ran from the temple, the animals ran from the temple, he turned over the money changers' tables. But you know, there must have been something about Christ because the children were not afraid of him. Right after all of the salesmen and were chased out, the children came and they were singing and the people came and he was teaching them. He cleansed the sanctuary. You know, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And if you want Jesus to abide there, if you want it to be a place of praise and prayer, you need to allow him to clean out the worldly things, the merchandise, the love of the world, the things of the world, and the animals. You know, we've all got this carnal, animalistic side of our nature that must be out of control. It must not be on the throne in the holy place. We're all part animal, but the animal side of our being should not be in the decision throne. Amen? Christ, Christ cleansed the sanctuary on earth during the time of his first coming and he is going to cleanse the sanctuary on earth and in heaven before his second coming. Now we're going to focus on the longest time prophecy in the Bible and it begins with the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8. Now let's go to question number one. I have a lot to say. An amazing vision is found in which he saw a ram with two horns. Whom does this ram represent? It tells us right there, we don't need to guess. The angel explained, the ram which you saw having the two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Remember to say the answers, you watching around the country and around the world, call them out with me. Let's go right to question number two. Next, Daniel saw a goat with a great horn between his eyes. What does this mean? What country, what kingdom does this goat represent? The rough goat that you saw that ends up attacking the ram is the king of Grecia or Greece. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, who do you think that first king is, the goat with the first horn? What does that represent? That first horn, that great king that made the Greek kingdom prominent was Alexander the Great, who went rapidly. The Bible tells us this goat doesn't even touch the ground because he moves so fast. In about four years, Alexander conquered the then civilized world. And he went from one victory to the next, but he could not conquer his lower nature. Basically, he drank himself to death. And unless a man learns how to rule himself, Proverbs tells us a man who can rule his passions and his temper is stronger than one who captures a city. But it goes on and tells us next that after Alexander managed to conquer the world, that he was broken, that prominent home, horn. He died suddenly. And that being broken, whereas four stood up for it. Say it with me. Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation. When Alexander died, as he was breathing his last, tradition tells us, Roxana, his wife, he married a Persian gal. She said, who is going to rule in your place? And he, with his parting breath, said, the strongest. He did have a son, but his son did not rule. His kingdom was divided among his four generals. And it slowly disintegrated until the next empire came into power. And that's where we go now with our next question. Question number three. Then a little horn sprouts up from one of the four horns on the goat. What power does this little horn represent? Claudius Caesar had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. What power was ruling the world when Jesus was born? 
Augustus Caesar commanded all the world should be taxed, the census. That was a tax. Rome was then the power ruling the world. Now, you know, the very fact that Daniel is foretelling this is really astounding when you consider it. Let me give you a, a, a principle that I think will be very helpful at this point about how God operates in some of these apocalyptic prophecies in the Bible. The Lord will tell the same story several different ways so everybody gets it. You know, Jesus did this during his ministry. He would teach the principles of truth using a variety of parables to tell the same point. In the stories of Daniel, in the prophecies of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, he covers the history of the kingdoms of the world in the metal image. Remember our opening study. Daniel chapter 7, he covers the kingdoms of the world that would govern God's people and persecute God's people through four beasts. Daniel chapter 8, he covers the same time period using the goat and the ram and the horns. Different dimensions give you depth and understanding. That's why you've got more than one eye, so that you've got a depth perception. It helps you see in stereo, if you will. That's why you've got ears. You can hear in stereo, so to speak. When you get to Revelation, I'm going to give you something. This seminar doesn't have time to get into all the prophecies of Revelation, but very quickly. Revelation chapter 2 covers the history of the church from the first coming to the second coming of Jesus. Remember, he said the time is at hand. In the seven churches. The seven churches. That's not all it covers, but that's one prominent theme. It covers the history of the churches, starting with Ephesus, ending with Laodicea. It gives you what the church would go through until Jesus comes. At the church of Laodicea, it says the Amen. I stand at the door and knock. He's about to come. Then you get the seven seals of Revelation. You've got the political history of the church from the first coming to the second coming. In the seven trumpets, among other things, it teaches the military history of what the church had to cope with from the first coming to the second coming. So God is covering the same thing through different perspectives. Now, in this prophecy about the ram and the goat, it's talking about the horns. This little horn that comes up starts out as the Roman power, which did come up out of one of the four divisions of Alexander's kingdom. You think about the incredible knowledge of God. What would you think right now if I told you in 300 years from now, Tasmania will be the world empire? Now, don't anyone laugh. They'll be offended. But how many of you would predict that would happen right now? Doesn't seem like they're going to be the world power. That's how unlikely it looked when Daniel prophesied that Greece would be a world empire. No one would have guessed it when Daniel made that prediction. And even less, the tribes that lived in Italy that had been formed by Romulus and Remus, the two brothers who were supposedly weaned by wolves, they used to think that was a fable until they discovered in modern times two different examples of children who were cared for by wolves. Did you know that? Two modern scientific documented examples, one in India, one in France. So it may be Romulus and Remus, these two primitive brothers that founded Rome. Who would have predicted they would be the rule world empire back then? That would have been a joke, laughable. But God's predictions never fall on the ground, right? God has a lot of surprises for us. Well, let's go on here. We've got a lot to cover. Let's go now. We're talking about this ram. The horn was broke off. And then a little horn comes out of one of the four divisions of the Greek power. We've learned that little horn is Rome. It starts out as Rome ruled by the Caesars, a political kingdom just like others. But the prophecy goes on to say something happens. He shall be diverse from the first. You know, you had iron in the legs, which was Rome of Daniel 2. But then it turns to iron and clay. It became the Roman Empire po po political system mixed with religion, clay. And that's what happened in Europe. The Roman Empire, as it began to disintegrate as an empire, the Roman Church began to gain strength, and it was diverse. It's now not just a political power, it's a religious political institution that was the prominent power. Daniel foretold that. Question number four. Daniel was told that this little horn would defile the sanctuary how long until it would be cleansed? Now, I'm going to read the answer here, and then I want to go to the Bibles with you. Say it with me. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. All right, now open your Bibles with me. Go to Daniel chapter 8, please. Daniel chapter 8. And for those of you who are using the Seminar Unlimited Bibles, 
That is going to be found on page 1312. Speaking of the little horn power, and incidentally, the little horn power you find here ends up being the same uh, Antichrist power that you find in Daniel chapter 7. Now Daniel chapter 8, it says, go to verse 12. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and it prospered. Here is this religious political institution that pushed truth aside, cast it down. Incidentally, Jesus said, I am the truth. And when we in any degree cast the truth to the ground, to some extent we're rejecting Christ himself. To whatever extent you embrace truth, you are embracing Jesus because he is the very essence of truth, right? So that's why these principles of truth we're teaching in this seminar are very, very important because as you accept or reject them, you are in part accepting or rejecting Christ. And that's why you want to cling tenaciously to the truth. Am I right, friends? Amen. The truth will set you free. It liberates. Well, this power was casting the truth to the ground. And the sanctuary was defiled. Now, go with me to verse 14. The angel's asking to another angel, how long shall it be concerning the vision until the, why the sanctuary and the host are trodden underfoot? Verse 14 says, Un, he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay, now before you can really understand what is being cleansed, you need to understand the sanctuary. Back in the days of Moses, when they were going through the wilderness, how many sanctuaries were there? One, I hear you say, two. Remember, the one Moses built on earth was a model of the genuine in heaven. Am I right? Amen. Okay. When Christ ministered here on earth, how many sanctuaries were there? Two. One on earth when he started. He said, my father's house, but there's also the temple of God, the dwelling place of God in heaven. After the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. by Titus and the Roman army, then how many temples were there? Two. <laughs> Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands. He wasn't saying the Jews were going to do it. He knew the Romans would. He said, I'll raise up one without hands. And the Bible tells us in the Gospel of John, he spoke of what? His body. His body is the church. What? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. So how many temples are there today? Two. You've got the one on earth and you've got the one in heaven. But you don't look convinced. So get your Bibles. You believe the Bible? Amen. Get your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. That's in the New Testament. Okay, verse 19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You and I are the temple of God. Paul said, what don't you know? Ye are the temple of God. Amen? Not only is it there in Ephesians, but you can look also to where Peter explains that you and I are the temple of God. So this sanctuary that's going to be cleansed, which one was going to be cleansed? The one in heaven or the one on earth? Both. Both. The one on earth, why does it need cleansing? Because the truth has been cast to the ground and there's a bunch of defiling doctrines of devils that found their way into the church. Number five, how did Daniel respond when he saw the little horn power persecute God's people and obscure the truth? Well, the Bible tells us in Daniel 8, 27, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick. Remember, he's, you know, getting up there now in age. He's probably pushing 90 years of age. I was sick certain days, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So here the angel comes and gives Daniel this vision, but he physically cannot bear to take all in. When he sees what's happening to God's people, his heart is yearning over God's people, and he faints. So in chapter 9, the angel comes back later to give him understanding. Now, Daniel prayed. One of the most beautiful prayers that you're going to find in the Bible is in Daniel chapter 9. And it says that the angel Gabriel came at the beginning of his prayer. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I've come to tell you. You've heard of uh, the speed of sound. What is that, 700-something miles an hour? Speed of light is what, 186,000 miles per second? In heaven, the angels go faster than that. Highway patrol aren't going to even catch them there. <laughs> angels travel the speed of thought. Because here Daniel starts praying, and before his prayer is finished, God from 
his dwelling place through the nebula Orion, wherever paradise happens to be, hundreds of thousands of light years away, he says, Gabriel, I want you to go to Daniel and fill him in. Give him the rest of the information. Nice thing also is that Gabriel appears to Mary hundreds of years later. He has no wrinkles. Same angel, has not aged a bit. Won't it be nice when we get our glorified bodies and enter eternity, friends? Okay, question number six. Then in the next chapter, the angel explains the prophecy in greater detail. How long was the time period that had not previously been described in the first vision of chapter 8? An additional time period is given to Daniel. What is that additional time period? He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to seal up the vision and prophecy, and there's more to it than that, to anoint the most holy. Now, go with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. And when I find that, that's page... 1314, 1314, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, what was the theme of Daniel's prayer? Let me tell you. The children of Israel were in captivity. Daniel is saying, Lord, we have not fulfilled our purpose as a people. You know what the principal purpose was for the Jewish people? I mean, do you think, and remember, I'm Jewish, so this is near to my heart. Do you think that God said, you know, I don't like everybody the same. I'm going to just save Jews and then leave? No, the purpose of the Jewish people was he committed to them the oracles of truth, Paul tells us. They were to be the protectors of those oracles of truth. They were to be a nation of priests to bring the world unto God and to introduce the Messiah to the world. They were to introduce the Messiah to the world. But like the church today, they often failed to fulfill God's plan for them. They continually backslid, as you and I sometimes do, right? So... Daniel's praying, Lord, how long until the Messiah comes? Will you give us another chance? How long until we fulfill our purpose? And he says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, who are Daniel's people? The Jews. Amen. Now, one time Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother? This is Matthew 18. Seven times? And what did Jesus say? I say not unto you seven times, but 70 times seven Christ was looking back to that same probationary period of mercy that God gave the nation. Not 490 times of forgiveness, but 490 years of forgiveness. He said, I'm going to plant you back in the promised land, and I'm going to give you 490 years to introduce the Messiah. And before that time's up, he's going to be anointed, and he is going to begin confirming the covenant, and he'll complete his ministry. Now, let's go on with our prophecy, and I'm hoping that by the time we reach the end of this study, the final pieces of the puzzle will fit into place, and you will get the whole picture. Where are we now? Question number seven. What was the starting point for this whole time prophecy? Wait, wait, let me back up a second here. We're looking at two prophecies. Daniel chapter 8, 2,300 days, the sanctuary will be cleansed. But he never tells us when that time period starts. Daniel fainted, remember? Daniel chapter 9, the angel comes back. He said, let me finish the whole thing. There's another time prophecy and the same starting point for both. Okay? So, now, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, gives us the starting point for both the 2,300 days and the 70-week prophecy. This is question 7. The answer is, when is the starting point? Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Okay, God is dividing that 490 years up. Is he trying to confuse us? It's basic math. First of all, keep in mind, a day is a year in prophecy. We'll get to that in a second. He starts out by saying seven weeks. Now, how many days in seven weeks? Seven times seven is? 49, 49 days. There were 49 years that it took them to finish building the temple and rebuilding the walls and the streets of Jerusalem. So that's why he divides off that section. Then he says there will be 62 weeks. Three score and two is, a score is 20. Three score is 60 and two. 62 weeks plus seven weeks is 69 weeks. 
Now, he said that there's 70 weeks for your people, but he stops at the 69 weeks because at the end of the 69 weeks, the Messiah would be anointed, okay? And he tells us that. Now, what is the starting point? The going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. When was that command given? The command was given, it's the decree of King Artaxerxes in 457 B.C. You can find this in your Bibles in Ezra 7.7. There were several decrees that gave the children of Israel permission to go home, but the last decree was the one that gave them full and complete commission, and he actually funded the reconstruction of the temple and the walls and the streets, and that was the decree given by Artaxerxes, one of the most cleanly established dates in Bible history, 457 B.C. All right, we've got our starting point. Now, are we supposed to go 483 days? See, 62, rather 69 weeks is 483 days. Are we supposed to go through our 483 days from 457 or 483 what? Years. years. We've learned in prophecy a day equals a year. Here's some scriptures that support that. I've appointed thee each day for a year. The spies wandered for 40 days because of their unbelief. God said, you've got to wander 40 years. Ezekiel 4, 6, each day for a year. Numbers 14, 34. Um, so you've got also one other in the New Testament. I think Jesus is the most convincing. Remember when Jesus um, was approached by some of Herod's representatives. John the Baptist had been executed six months into his ministry. And Jesus said, go tell that fox that I teach and do cures and cast out devils today, tomorrow, and the third day I will be perfected or completed. Did Jesus preach three more days or did he preach three more years? Christ preached three more years, am I right? And so Christ even used the day for the year prophecy, that principle. All right, now let's go to question number eight. The angel said, if you count 69 weeks from 457 B.C., you'll come to the Messiah, the Prince. Did that happen? 69 weeks is 483 years. A day is a year in prophecy. So if we, uh, let's read the answer now. That word I say, you know, that after the baptism, which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. The Bible says he would be anointed. Now, when did that happen? Starting point is the prophecy in 457 B.C., Okay, we've got that deed right there. That's the decree of Artaxerxes. Then if you go 483 years, you've got the baptism of Jesus. How do we know Jesus was baptized in 27 AD? I am so thankful for the book of Luke. Luke gives us a very precise time for the ministry of Christ. He names in the beginning of chapter 3 and 4, it was, there was one year in Roman history when Pontius Pilate and Tiberius Caesar and um, these Roman officials and Herod were all reigning simultaneously. There's only one time it could have been 27 AD. It is exactly 483 years from 457 BC to 27. You remember what God said in Daniel chapter 9? To anoint the most holy. Christ began his ministry at his baptism. Then it goes on to tell us that he would preach for three and a half years in person. And let's go on now with question number nine, and you'll find out more about that. I've got a lot of details to share here with you, and I'm praying the Lord will give me the grace to cover this all. Number nine, what was to take place next in the prophecy? It said in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Remember, he said there'll be seven weeks, then another three score and two weeks, and after that three score and two week period, a total of 69 weeks, the Messiah is cut off. Was Jesus cut off after that first 69 week period? Yes, he was. Matter of fact, it goes on to tell us, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. How many days in a week? Seven. What would be half of seven? Three, three and a half. Are we talking about seven days or seven years? Yes. Seven years. You know, three and a half is a very important number in prophecy. Seven represents completion, perfection, a complete cycle. Three and a half is a complete interruption in that. It represents a time of rejection and apostasy. Remember the famine in the days of Elijah when Jezebel and Ahab were persecuting the prophets. Three and a half years, no rain, apostasy. 
Then you get to Revelation. Oh, during the ministry of Christ. Three and a half years. Was he accepted or rejected? It was a time of rejection and apostasy. Then you get to Revelation, and it talks about this same three and a half time period during the Dark Ages, three different ways. It says 1,260 days, that's three and a half years. 42 months, that's three and a half years. And then it says a time and a times. That means a time was one complete cycle of seasons, one year. A times was a couple. One plus a couple is three and a half. One plus a couple is three and a half. Okay? Using fingers here. To so you've got that time period mentioned three different ways in Revelation, so there'd be no missing it. It's a very important time period. Jesus preached three and a half years, and in the middle of that last week, he caused the sacrifice to cease. You remember what happened? It says that the veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom. Ultimately, the temple was destroyed. There are no more sacrifices. The Jews do not sacrifice in the temple anymore because the veil is taken away in Christ. And I may shock some of you, but I'm going to tell you that I don't believe the temple is going to be rebuilt. Most of the Protestant world believes the temple in Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. How many of you have heard that? I've been over there to Israel two different occasions and they have no concrete plans. There are extreme groups that Orthodox people that are trying to talk about rebuilding the temple, but you know what kind of a volatile situation that would be to take one of these sacred temples of the Muslims and destroy it and rebuild the temple? The other thing is the Jewish theology around the world has been adjusted to accommodate not needing to go to the temple and sacrifice lambs. They haven't had it for 1900 years. They've gone through a little bit of evolution in that time. Trust me, I'm Jewish. And so I don't know any of my Jewish friends who are saying, oh, I hope they'll rebuild the temple so we can sacrifice lambs again. I don't know any of them that are saying that. There are some ultra-Orthodox in Israel. I want to admit that is true. But when it says that the beast power will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, what temple is that? The one in heaven or the temple on earth? The church. He puts himself over the church, putting himself in the position of God. And all this while, people are waiting for someone over there in the Middle East to rebuild a physical temple. Let me show you something that is a very dangerous misunderstanding of this passage. Turn to Daniel chapter 9 again. Please, friends, uh, if you disagree with me, let's be agreeable about it. We want to pray that God will guide us in our understanding. Amen? When it says in Daniel chapter 9, verse, no, oh, let's see here, verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. Now, what is the subject of this whole prophecy? The anointing of the Messiah, the ministry, the death of the Messiah. The Messiah is the subject of Daniel 9. There's no question about it. Don't forget that. The Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. He was cut off for Doug. He was cut off for you. Amen? In the midst of his life, 30 years old, in his prime, he died for our sins. He didn't lay down his life when he was all worn out. He gave his best for you and me. Amen? Amen. Cut off in the middle of his life. And it says, Then the people of the prince that shall come, small p, the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood. We've learned that means a lot of people. They swarmed over it and destroyed it. Unto the end, the war and desolations are determined. Now, verse 27 is where there's a lot of misunderstanding. And he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Who is it that confirms the covenant? Do you know that a lot of people think it's the Antichrist confirming the covenant? I respectfully disagree. I believe the subject here is the Messiah. I don't find a record anywhere in the Bible where the Antichrist makes a covenant with God's people. But the Messiah, God has made a covenant with his people. And he comes and he confirms the covenant with them for one week. In person, Jesus does it three and a half years in person. Then he does it for another three and a half years through the apostles. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 in your Bible. So I regret that we haven't had more time. You know, I like this verse. I heard a preacher say one time, I've got a question for you that you can't answer. I've got a question that God can't answer and angels can't answer. And that always gets everybody's attention. Here's the question, friends. And then he reads Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How are we going to escape if we neglect? It doesn't say, you know, to, um, to curse it or to expel it, but just neglect. So many people are neglecting it. Which was the first spoken by the Lord, three and a half years, the Lord did it. Then it was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. 
Three and a half years in person, Christ confirmed the covenant with his people. Then he said to the disciples as he went to heaven, As the Father sent me, I'm commissioning you. Now you go confirm it with just the Jews. For the first three and a half years of the apostles' ministry, they did not go to the Gentiles. They finished their commission to confirm the covenant with the Jewish nation. On Pentecost, there were devout Jews out of every nation. On Pentecost, it was Jews who were baptized with the Holy Spirit. 3,000, then 5,000, and I'll get to that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. But it's exciting, isn't it? All right, here we've got the graph now. For three and a half years, Christ confirms the covenant. He dies in 31 A.D., but the whole week is not up, up yet. You've heard about the seven years of tribulation? You know where the idea of the seven years of tribulation comes from? Some of my dear charismatic friends take the last week of this prophecy they cut it off of the 490 years and they move it down at the end of time and they say it applies to the Antichrist. You do not find the phrase seven years of tribulation anywhere in Scripture. This is a philosophy that came from a Jesuit priest named Francisco Rivera uh, during, it was kind of a, a counter-reformation uh, interpretation of prophecy. The sad thing now is Protestants are all embracing this. It's not what uh, the church used to believe. Question number 10. Jesus told his disciples to preach first to which group of people? What did Christ say? Go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Christ came first to confirm the covenant with his people, the Jews. Not that they're better, but they were to be the ones to introduce the Messiah. That was their purpose as a people. They had the foundation. They had the oracles of truth. Do you know that most Jews... In the time of Christ, Jewish children memorized the whole book of Deuteronomy? We can't get people, we can't Christ, get Christians to memorize the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Jesus, all three times he was tempted by the devil, he quoted Deuteronomy to the devil, saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. So God was to use them to then take the gospel to the Gentiles. Number 11, what warning did Jesus give to his chosen people? Answer, he said, if they did not embrace the gospel message, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Question number 12. So what is that other nation spoken of by Jesus in Matthew 21, 43, which would become his chosen people? The Bible tells us, if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Furthermore, Romans 2, 28 and 29. He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Amen. You know, this is a big area where people are confused, friends. I always shock folks. I like shock therapy. God is only going to save Jews. And then I explain. I hope I explain before I have a heart attack. Don't want to leave you with the wrong idea here. How many believe we are saved under the new covenant? Gentiles are saved under the new covenant. Do you agree with that? Don't be bashful. It's not a trick question. Yes, it is a trick question. Here we go. I will make, I'm quoting, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. If you want to appreciate and if you want to embrace the new covenant, you must be of what? The house of Israel. You read Romans chapter 11. The Bible says the Gentiles are grafted into the stock of Israel. We become spiritual Jews. Amen. That's why we are adopted in. That's why Jesus said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, but they're going to hear my voice and they're going to come into the fold. You see, we become part of God's people. We become the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by faith. Amen. Shalom. See, you all become spiritual Jews. Amen. Okay? Now, some people have a problem with that, and I'm sorry, you got a problem. There are some people who are anti-Semitic. And it's amazing to me how Christians can be anti-Semitic. You're holding a Jewish book. Peter, James, and John were Jews. You're worshiping a Jewish Savior, and you're going to be anti-Semitic. That doesn't make sense to me, friends. I remember one time when somebody found out that I named my oldest son Micah Levi. And she knew I was a Christian. This lady leaned over. She said, Levi? She said, that's what the Jews named their children. And I said, I'm Jewish. <laughs> oh, Found out there's a little anti-Semitism in the church. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Let's look at the graph here again. We're making progress. So the decree is 457 B.C. Now we're looking first at the 490-year prophecy. In a moment, we'll get to the longest time prophecy. In the midst of the week, 8031, Jesus 
is crucified. Remember, he's anointed, begins his ministry, 27, 31 AD. He confirms the covenant. He causes the sacrifice to cease. You don't have to guess about this. It says in the Bible, the temple curtain was rent. He now was the fulfillment of all that. Then for another three and a half years, it says, he confirmed the covenant, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, through those who heard him. Amen? So well, this isn't guesswork, friends. That seven weeks is not talking about the Antichrist. It's talking about the Messiah. I don't know how people came to embrace Jesuit theology in the Protestant churches. It's a tragedy. Now, what happened after that 34 AD period? Get your Bibles one more time. Turn with me to Acts chapter 7. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was preaching to the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, the highest voice of the Jewish nation. This takes place in 34 AD. After he preaches probably the most spirit-filled sermon in the New Testament, I believe even more than Pentecost, the leaders find out they have crucified their Messiah. They are so overcome with guilt. Instead of saying, what must we do to be saved? When they're convicted, they retaliate with aggression. The Bible says in verse 54, this is page 1603, Acts chapter 7, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. You ever seen someone furious and they grit their teeth? But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice. They drowned him out. They stopped their ears. What does it mean when the judge plugs his ears? Not a good sign, is it? Your case is not looking hopeful. They stopped their ears. They ran upon him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Oh, it's very interesting the way the story is beginning to weave together. And he, they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. He was calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. At the end of Christ's first three and a half years, he was rejected by the leaders. They killed him. He said, Father, forgive them. At the end of the next three and a half years, the religious leaders rejected Stephen. They plugged their ears, saying that as a nation, they had rejected the message of Jesus. That doesn't mean that time is up for the Jewish people. You read the first thing it says in Romans 11. It says, has God forsaken them? God forbid. There's still a special place for the Jewish nation. But now it's gone beyond that. And he kneeled down, verse 60, and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. We've learned what that means. Christians don't die, they go to sleep. Amen? Amen. And soon Stephen's going to wake up. Jesus is coming. Verse 1, chapter 8, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, as you keep reading, you find out then... Who else is converted in the next chapter? Chapter 9, Paul is converted. He then takes the gospel to the Gentiles. Chapter 10, Peter then goes to Cornelius. He takes the gospel to the Gentiles. He has that dream about the sheet. Some people think that means you can eat anything that crawls across your plate. But the purpose for that dream is to say that God is no respecter of men. He has called no man unclean. And so then the gospel went to the Gentiles. 34 AD is when that happened. According to the angel who spoke with Daniel, what would happen at the end of the 2,300 years? Now we're going to the longest time prophecy in the Bible. Remember, he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now I want to stop here and say something about this verse. Some Bibles read, unto 2,300 evenings and mornings. Have you seen that? And they say, see, you can't translate 2,300 days. A day for a year does not work in this prophecy, Doug. I respectfully disagree. The context of Daniel chapter 8 is talking about the Day of Atonement. How often did the Day of Atonement take place? Once a year. So if you're talking about 2,300 evening and morning sacrifices that occurred on the Day of Atonement once a year, you're still talking about 2,300 years. So whether it says evenings and mornings, or whether you say 2,300 days, like the King James Version, it's 2,300 years prophetically, okay? What was going to happen after that time period? It says the sanctuary would be cleansed. If you go from 457 B.C. 
2,300 years, it reaches to 1844. That's 1,810 years beyond the 490-year prophecy. 1844. What happened in 1844? All right, time for a history lesson. If you understand prophecy, especially when you're studying the last prophecies in the Bible, you've got to look at history, don't you? Are you aware of something called the Great Religious Awakening that took place in the early 1800s? It was also called the Great Advent Movement. Not to be confused with Seventh-day Adventists, they did not even organize as a church until 1863. But there were people around the world who simultaneously were studying the prophecies of Revelation and came to the conclusion that Jesus was coming back in 1844 based on Daniel chapter 8. 2,300 days, the sanctuary will be cleansed. They thought the sanctuary is the earth. God's going to cleanse it with fire. Jesus is coming in 1844. It was called the Millerite Movement or the Great Advent Movement. And not only in North America, but a Jew named Joseph Wolf was preaching in Europe and Africa, and a Catholic priest discovered these truths. He was preaching in South America and all around the world at the same time they discovered this time prophecy. They thought it meant Jesus was coming in 1844. You can look it up in your encyclopedia. It's a historical fact. He didn't come. It's called the Great Disappointment. A lot of people just gave up their faith. Some went back to their churches. Some gave up on God. But during that time, a group of believers from many different churches got together. They said, let's put aside our differences. Let's find out what the Bible really teaches, okay? And they then began to rediscover the truths that had been given to the apostles in the New Testament. They discovered the Sabbath truth again. They discovered the truth that you don't go right to heaven or hell at death, but you sleep until the resurrection. They discovered again that baptism is by immersion, not by sprinkling or pouring. And some of these things that you're being taught in this seminar. God began to cleanse his sanctuary on earth in 1844 from the defilement of the dark ages, from the truth that had been cast to the ground. And he began to cleanse the sanctuary in heaven. Christ left his service as the daily sacrifice. He entered the last phase as our high priest in heaven. We are living in the time of the judgment. Christ is completing his last phase as our high priest in heaven right now. When he's done, He'll declare, he that is just, let him be just still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. In Revelation, when you open the book, Jesus appears among seven candlesticks. He's in the first apartment of the sanctuary. You go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. It says, I saw the temple of God open in heaven, and I beheld the ark. What part of heaven was the ark in? It was in the Holy of Holies. Then it says, and there were thunderings and voices and earthquakes and lightning and a great hail, and Jesus comes. After he finishes his work by the ark, he comes. So he is now completing his work as our high priest, the heavenly day of atonement, Yom Kippur, if you will. He's cleansing the sanctuary in heaven from the sins of the people, a time of judgment, and he's cleansing the sanctuary on earth from the false doctrines. When he's done cleansing us, and he's done cleansing there. The laundromat's going to close, and Jesus is going to come. Can you say amen? amen? Number 14. Whose cases are being considered in the pre-Advent judgment? Obviously, the Lord is considering the cases of those who have claimed to know him. Judgment must begin at the house of God. You read Ezekiel 9. It talks about this judgment that comes upon people who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. And he begins with the ancient men at the sanctuary, at the house of God. Judgment begins among those who claim to know the Lord because the lost are lost. He's not judging them. They're not saved. The judgment is to determine if those who take the name of Christ are genuine or counterfeit. Number 15, what will be examined in this phase of the judgment? Answer, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. So they're books. God's got records, okay? Then answer B, for God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. But Doug, we're saved by faith through grace. Yes, and if you are saved by faith through grace, your works will bear witness. James says, I will show you my faith, or you show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. People who say, Lord, Lord, and don't have the works that go along with it are hypocrites. They talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Amen? <laughs> Furthermore, in this judgment, it says, they'll be judged by the law of liberty. In that same chapter, James quotes two of the Ten Commandments. What is the law of liberty? Psalms 119, verse 44 and 45. I will keep your commandments forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty because I seek your precepts. I'm not afraid as I walk the streets of Manhattan. 
There's a lot of people who are in jail right now because they've broken the law. I keep it. That same law that incarcerates them liberates me. Amen? Amen. When you obey God's law, it's a law of liberty. Number 16, is God my accuser in this judgment? No, Jesus is your best friend. The Bible tells us that the devil is your accuser. That old serpent called the devil and Satan was cast to the earth. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Just as Satan stood and accused Job before the Lord, and as Satan stood and accused Joshua the high priest before the Lord, he will tempt you to sin, and then he will turn you in for doing it. So don't listen to him. He stands as your accuser. Number 17, must I stand in the judgment alone, in the pre-advent judgment alone? No. We have some promises here, friends. This is not an answer you fill out. John 1, our first John 2, 1, Jesus is our advocate. John 5, 22, Jesus is our judge. John, I'm sorry, Revelation 3, 14, Jesus is our faithful and true witness. He's our witness, he's our judge, he's our advocate, friends. He is going to do everything on the side of justice and mercy he can do to save you. But you must give him your heart. He is in heaven now interceding in your behalf. Don't you think that you would like to trust him with your life? You know, there's a story of a man who was a father in a small country. His son was a terrible rebel. The father was the judge in the community. One day, the son went out on a crime spree after drinking one night. He robbed a home, murdered the occupants, and he was brought before his father for judgment. Father, after looking at the evidence, said, I find you guilty, and the sentence is death. Then he got off his bench. He went down to his son. He embraced his son. He said, son, I want you to know that I love you. He kissed him. And then the father took off his robe, and he went towards the execution chamber. God loves us. He is our Father, but He's also our judge. Right now, the doors of that heavenly temple are open. He's interceding in our behalf. Sometimes we presume upon God's mercy. That door of mercy is open now. Christ is forgiving sin now. He's washing away sin now. But He is completing His final work in the heavenly temple in your behalf and in mine. We must not linger. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, friends? Now, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. God has foretold in these prophecies the history of the world. He's foretold that he's raising up a church that would be cleansed. He's cleansing his sanctuary on earth. Not only is he cleansing the church, but the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is cleansing your sanctuary if you'll let him, friends. He wants to cleanse you from sin before he returns. But you need to come just like you are and say, Lord, forgive me and then give me power, give me grace to be willing to do your will. I'd like to ask you before we pray together, your last appeal question here, if Jesus is your attorney in the judgment, he promises to win your case, will you turn your life over to him today? Friends, take your lesson, and I hope you'll write yes there. You know, sometimes we feel like we cannot trust the earthly attorneys, but I want to promise you, you've got an advocate in heaven who is honest, that you can trust. Amen. Amen. Is that your desire, friends, to say, Jesus, take my case. Take my case. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the intercession of your Son in our behalf. Forgive our sins. We want to claim the blood of Jesus to wash us from all sin. Lord, not only do we want to be washed from our sins, we pray that you will wash our minds, cleanse our sanctuaries from the defiling doctrines that have been planted there. Help us to have an understanding of what is truth, because Jesus is the truth that will set us free. Please bless these people who are struggling with some of the things they're learning. I pray that the seeds that are planted in their souls will bear fruit and a harvest for eternal life. We ask in Christ's name, amen. God bless you, friends. We'll see you in our next meeting Friday.